Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello everyone, welcome back to lecture 18 of Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. Um, we are going to take, uh, uh, you know, the lead from the previous lecture where we had relaxed one of the assumptions of a classical linear regression model. In the previous lecture, we had relaxed the assumption that the model errors are homoscedastic and we introduced heteroscedasticity into the variance covariance structure of model errors through the spatial dependence uh, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, prices of ho homes, for example, or groundwater levels, uh, uh, etc. Right? In today's lecture, we are going to sort of take a, we are going to take another step and we are going to relax the assumption A2, which in lecture 16, we established as, a, as an assumption uh, fundamental for, uh, for causal inference. So to be able to move from correlation to causation, we require that the expectation, the conditional expectation of model errors is zero. That is expectation ui given xi is zero, where xi is an explanatory variable, all right? And we also saw that that assumption is also important for unbiasedness of a least squares estimator. So in the previous lecture, what we studied was a generalized least squares estimator. Remember that had got nothing to do with unbiasedness or causality. It was in order to reconcile the heteroscedastic model error structure, okay? Uh, so before we sort of move forward and directly, uh, you know, deal with the problem of causal inference, let's, you know, get back to specifying spatial dependence with the notion of spatial lags. So in the previous lecture, we had, that is lecture 17, we had said that, you know, we could imagine a classical regression model, a traditional regression model that we are used to, uh, wherein each value of dependent variable y i has an index i which does not only, you know, provide us an id for, uh, you know, for whom this value y is measured, but also the location. So in that case, we could say, you know, y i j, which is equivalent to saying y at, uh, you know, coordinates i comma j. So this, uh, you know, uh, 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 enrichment of the notation is explicitly to account for spatiality in data. And then if you have a regular lattice, what is a regular lattice? Well, a regular lattice is uh, where you have equal, uh, you know, you have a, uh, 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 you know, uh, a equi-sized cells, you know, constructed by uh, n rows and m columns in general. Okay, that is a regular lattice. That is to say that if I am, uh, you know, I am considering the value of yi at any given, any given cell, I will be able to find its neighbor in the north, one step up, equal size cell. So, you know, if I take a step down, that is southward, I'll find another neighbor. Similarly, a neighbor on the east and a neighbor on the west, right? So, so this idea can be notationally represented as what you have already understood. Shifting up would mean y, uh, you know, i minus 1 and j, right? Then you have shifting down, we are calling it y i plus 1 j. So i is representing the vertical direction. Downward south is conventionally taken to be positive. It is a, you know, it is defined that way you could have also had it vice versa. Similarly, shifting left will give me the same i, but it will bring my j down from j to j minus 1. And on the right, I will have y i j plus 1, right? So all of you are conversant with this by now. Now, the issue is that this is a very stylized type of a spatial structure. The data all don't always exist in such nice uh, niceties uh, so far as the spatial structure is concerned. 
A very good example or case in point is the groundwater monitoring data that we have seen throughout this course. Right? So we have seen that data for the state of Uttar Pradesh. So if you, if you pay attention, like, uh, you know, I'm going to draw an approximate shape of, uh, you know, uh, of that state. And, uh, you know, it looks like something like as following. It's not to scale, not to shape, it's just an approximation. Right? And there, when we look at, you know, the groundwater data, we saw a very dense cluster of wells on the west. And when we move to south, you have a generally uh, sorry, on the east, we have a generally sparse, uh, you know, model, uh, uh, sorry, monitoring network. And the monitoring network becomes denser around urban areas, right? So, these are just our, our, our observations till now, okay? So, in that case, you know, we don't have the nice, uh, you know, representation of a regular lattice in case of a real world data. In that case, if you want to specify spatial dependence, we bring in the notion of spatially lagged variables, okay? So we bring in the notion of spatially lagged variables. So let's go ahead and look at an example where we will try to construct these spatially lagged variables for groundwater data. In order to construct spatially lagged variables, we formalize the local similarity for describing the structure of interaction among the spatial units. Okay, so that's a sentence which, which is saying quite many things. So let's break it down. Okay, so we have, we're talking about the structure of interaction among spatial units. So we are trying to, to what, what are we trying to do? We are trying to describe a structure of interaction. And we are doing that through this idea of local similarity. Okay, so the fact that we believe in local similarity or local stationarity, you know, we, we are designating you know, spatial neighbors as the ones which will also provide an, uh, you know, a spillover effect on the value that is being measured, okay? So local similarity is in terms of the value observed, right? So the value uh, observation, okay? Value observed or, you know, the groundwater level observed, the price observed or whatever, right? We are describing it through the structure of interaction among spatial units. So we are saying that, you know, units that are there nearby might have similar values. This is also the idea of local stationarity, right? So we are, we are, when we are constructing these spatially lagged variables, we are basically, you know, uh, uh, following up on the ideas that we have, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, developed till now, right? So we are, we are now formalizing it. So the quantitative unit that formalizes interaction with neighbors at any given location in space is called as the spatial lag, very, very important. So we are now introducing an entity called as the spatial lag. It is a entity which formalizes interactions with neighbors for any given location in space. For example, I'm looking at, I'm defining a spatially lag groundwater level at location I. So I'm going on to location I, right? I am searching for its neighbors. So there are, there are some wells which are located near to I and there are some others which are located farther away from I, okay? But I'm interested in the spatially lagged value at location I. Remember, the groundwater level that is observed at location I is given as G of I, okay? We are trying to create a lag. So we are somehow summarizing information about what's happening around this location I. So GIL, where L is a representation of the spatial lag, is equal to WI1G1 plus all the way to WINGN, which is equal to summation J equals 1 WINGJ, right? I am able to provide a weight to each neighbor. So in case if, for example, we have this neighbor K, which is really, really far away, right? And we don't believe that this, it's going to have any spatial dependence of groundwater level at K on what's happening at location I, then, you know, I can conveniently say WIK is zero. But that, you know, specifying it to be zero or non-zero is, 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 is another matter. The point of the the point that I'm trying to make here is that this formulation of creating or constructing spatial lags by the help of these spatial weights, you know, allows me to, to, to generalize the idea of, you know, neighborhood spillovers or neighborhood effects, 
right? I don't have to go in and, uh, you know, specifically figure out who has how many neighbors. I can at least mathematically or notationally provide a general formulation of what a spatial lag means. So spatial lag is nothing but values in the neighborhood, values in the neighborhood such that they are weighted by a factor W i j for the jth neighbor or the j unit which is a neighbor of i in the given domain, right? In this formulation, everybody is designated a neighbor, right? A unit which is which is uh, proximate to i is also considered a neighbor. A unit which is farther away from i is also considered a neighbor. What differentiates these two units, which that is, which are uh, you know uh, proximate or farther away, is this weight uh, w i j. And so this nice you know representation j equals one to n uh, uh, w i j. Sorry for the typo. W i j g j provides me a norm, a, a, a generalized formalization of the spatial lag effect. So if I'm trying to understand what is the total extent of, you know, spatial effects on, uh, you know, the groundwater level at location I, that I should study in relation with this spatial lagged, uh, you know, uh, 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 entity summation J equals one to N W I J G J right, which concisely we write as G i capital L. This capital L is just a lag representation, okay. One thing to note here is that a location, any location is not its own neighbor. So location i is not her own neighbor. That means W i i will always be zero for all i, for all i, okay. So W i i will be zero for all i. Okay, uh, even though WII is zero, the, my general formulation doesn't change. I can always for any i, be it i equals one, two, three, four, five, n, I can use this formulation. The only, the only matter of to understand here is if I'm talking about the first location, location one, location ID one, then W11 will be zero. If I'm talking about location ID two, then W22 will be zero and so on and so forth. Okay, so overall, you know, constructing these spatial lags requires domain knowledge, right? But it summarizes pairwise interactions which would otherwise remain unidentified, okay? So the, the spatial lag is characterizing pairwise interactions. So I and J in a pairwise sense, the way they interact is summarized by the spatial lag. It's, it's a component of the construction of the spatial lag variable, right? But constructing it requires domain knowledge. How and why? Well, what value should WIJ carry, right? Should it be just zero and one? Well, should it be, you know, the nearer value should get larger, you know, a, a value of weights uh, than, the, than the ones that are farther away and how much, by how much, what's the difference between different weights? Just because two uh, points are equidistant to a location I, will they have the same uh, spillover effect? Well, these are matters of complexities and that's why if you are working with groundwater data, you know, just like, you know, we have seen in case of stationarity, we require a lot of very strong domain knowledge. Here too, we require strong domain knowledge, right? So if you're working on with groundwater data, it's best to work with, uh, you know, hydrologists. If you're working with agricultural data, it's probably best to, to consult with agronomists uh, and so on and so forth. If you're working with, uh, you know, uh, 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 geological data like coal, coal uh, 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 exploration data or oil exploration data, it's probably best to consult with geologists. Uh, if you're working with population density data, it's probably best to, uh, you know, uh, consult with uh, 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 population scientists, right? So whatever data set, whichever domain that your data set belongs to, one should, you know, read up the literature in that domain in order to do justice in defining these weights. Now potentially you have n times n minus one by two pairwise interactions, but only n groundwater observation locations. So you have a lot of pairwise interactions that you have to worry about, right? So for every i, there are n potential neighbors. Of course, herself is not a neighbor, so you can, you can remove it, but in this formulation, I am counting herself also a neighbor just because of the general form that I am studying, 
just because w i is zero, I'm not keeping it out. I'm just saying, you know, because it's not her own neighbor, i is not her own neighbor, I can simply assign or define w i i to be zero, but, but and then keep my, you know, uh, formulation of g i l to be exactly the same. But potentially I have n times, so, so some, you know, n times n minus one by two, which is much greater than n pairwise interactions to study, right? So if you have so many degrees of freedom and probably so many, you know, uh, unknowns, uh, you know, so many parameters to estimate, then probably, you know, it's not going to be very efficient. I'm also providing a matrix notation of the same entity here. So I'm calling GL as a general, you know, lag, spatial lag matrix. I'm not calling it GIL anymore. I'm calling it GL uh, is a n by one matrix. So we can, uh, you know, uh, we can write this down for our understanding. So I'm writing GL equals W times G. GL is considered is considered to be n by one, right? W is n by n and G is n by one. So W is n by n and G is n by one, right? So I have a lag matrix. matrix. So I have G1L. 2L, keep going, G, I, L, right, okay, G, 1L, G, 2L, keep going till G, I, L, then I have finally G, N, L. This is a N by 1 matrix, okay. This is equal to a N by N matrix of weights. So this will, each row will correspond to a, the a location 1, 2, i, you know, n. On the columns, I'm looking for neighbors. So everybody is neighbor to each other. The only thing is we have a weights understanding of them, right? So I have 1, 2, keep going, i, all the way till n. So columns are potential neighbors and rows are the entities for which we are trying to search neighbors for. This is again n by n and then g is just the location, the, the column of values observed at each location in my data set. So now <coughs> w1 and its neighbor w11, which is going to be zero, we have learned that. Then you have w12, w1i, all the way till W1N. So I have a weights, like row of weights sitting there as, you know, uh, uh, W11. Then I have for two W21, W22, W2I, all the way to W2N. Similarly, WI1, WI2, WII, WIN, then WN1, Wn2, Wni, Wnn, okay? So now I'm multiplying a n by n matrix by a n by one matrix. As we have seen earlier, they are conformable, perfect. The overall product will be a n by, sorry, sorry about that. So they are conformable because the number of columns on the W matrix is equal to the number of rows on the G matrix. And I multiply them, I'm going to get a n by one matrix right, something we are very well aware of. So let's write it down. So I have an n by one that I'm looking for. So the first column is to be multiplied by the first row to find the first cell of this n by one matrix. So this is going to be w11, g1, w12, g2, w1i, gi plus w1n, gn. Similarly, the second one will be summation i equals or j equals 1 to n w 2j gj, right? So I'm simply going to multiply the second row with the first column to get the second row of this n by 1 matrix. Similarly, I'm going to have j equals 1 to n w i j g i and then finally the last element will be j equals 1 to n w n j G, G, right? So now I can see that G, I, L equals 
the summation g i l equals summation j equals 1 to n w i j g j which is exactly the same as the scalar formation that we had seen on the previous page here. Okay? So, you know by now I am sure that you are very conversant between scalars and matrices, scalar forms and matrix forms of, of expressing the same linear equations, but you know it is very critical to keep learning, keep improving our translation between the two uh, devices that is why I decided to sort of you know uh, 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 solve this for you. Okay? My request that you please go over this on your at your own time so that it becomes absolutely clear uh, you know for your purposes. Right? Uh, as we go forward we are going to move to the matrix uh, uh, you know uh, uh, formulation more and more because matrix is so concise I mean uh, you know you have this type of a bulky g i l equals summation j equals 1 to n w i j g j such a bulky notation in scalar form for all i's going from 1 to n. All of these n equations so you have n equations sitting here are summarized in this simplistic matrix. Right. So, matrix form matrices are very useful, very handy when we are dealing with you know bulky notations. So, it is very important to learn to translate between scalar and matrix notations. So, so, so I request you to write it out at your own time so that it becomes uh, you know more and more natural going forward. So, the next step is to construct a spatial weights matrix. So, now we look at an example where there are some spatial units, spa unit 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 are you know uh, 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 are, 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 are assembled in a given spatial structure. What is the spatial structure? The spatial structure is such that 1 has is neighbors with 2, with 4 and with 5. So, 1 is neighbors with 2, with 4 and 5. 2 is neighbors with 1, with 5 and with 4. Right? So, 2 is also neighbors with 1, with 5 and with 4. 5 on the other hand is connected with uh, 1, 2, 4 and 3. So, 5 has 4 neighbors unlike you know uh, 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 1 and 2, 5 has many more neighbors. So, 5 has uh, you know 1, 4, uh, 2 and 3 as neighbors. 3 on the other hand has only 2 neighbors uh, 5 and 6. 6 finally has just one neighbor that is 3. Right? Now, this is a complex spatial structure. There are entities distributed in space. Right? Location is deterministic, it is not random. So, once you are located at you know as a neighbor of 2, 4 and 5 that is what it is for you. Right? So, if it is a home which is a large mansion at location 1 and it is it's connected to a uh, you know these 3 different homes, uh, home, home 2, home 4 and home 5 then their location are sort of fixed. You can only sort of you know uh, do as much in order to change the neighborhood of location 1. Right? So, the, this, this is the spatial constraint that is driven by the links that are exogenously driven. We do not get to choose who is connected to whom. Okay. What we get to do is we get to summarize that in a spatial weights matrix. So, what does this spatial weights matrix does? First of all you can see the diagonal elements are 0, these are w i i's which are 0. So, so, home 1 or location 1 is not her own neighbor, location 2 is not her own neighbor, location 3 is not her own neighbor and so on till location 6 not being her own neighbor. If we have 6 different entities the size of the weights matrix is 6 by 6 right. We are working with a 6 by 6 matrix right. Whenever we have a neighbor we provide a weight of 1 and if they are not neighbors we provide a weight of 0. So, if I go back to you know location 1 I had figured that 1 has 1 is neighbor with 2, 4 and 5. So, 2, 4 and 5 at locations 2, 4 and 5 in the columns I have 1's and for the rests I have 0's at 3 and 6. Right? Now, uh, if I look at it you know number of 1's that I find in rows 
number of ones provide me an understanding of how networked or how richly networked each location is. At an extreme is location 6 which only has one neighbor which is number 3, right. So 6 only has one neighbor, rest all are non-neighbors including herself, right. So, so that is how a weights matrix is able to concisely account for you know the neighborhood structure. Now we do not use these weights matrices, we define them as the way we have seen till now. Basically we assign a uh, you know an entity 1 if j is my neighbor and 0 if j is not my neighbor. For each row, for each i in my data I am going to do that. But I then row standardize these weights. What does it mean to row standardize? It basically means that each row must sum to 1, okay. So if I have a row with 3 different three ones and, and rests are zeros, I am going to multiply each of these by the sum of what is found on that row. So each value of 1 is now normalized by 3, so it becomes 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. Of course, the zeros are also divided by 3, but 0 divided by 3 is, is just a 0. If I look at, you know, uh, 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 you know, number 5, it has 4 neighbors, right, it has 4 neighbors, right. Now, what I do is I sum the row, I get 4, I divide the whole thing by 4, so I get 1, 4, 1 by 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 0 and 0 in that row, in row number 5, okay. Um, similarly, if I go and look at row number 2, again I have 3 neighbors overall for entity 2, I have only 2 neighbors for entity 3, so I have 1 half and 1 half. I have 3 neighbors for entity 4 and I have only 1 neighbor for entity 6. So I have a value 1, that is 1 divided by 1, right. So this is called as, so W prime is known as the row standardized, row standardized weights matrix, okay. It is called as the row standardized weights matrix. A question arises, why do we row standardize these matrices? Why do we row standardize these matrices? Well, to understand that, let us look at the following model. This model is a spatial regression model. What is happening in this model is that I am multiplying, I am, I am modeling g, which is a n by 1 vector, as a function of a lag of g, right. So this is gl which is nothing but again a n by 1 matrix where w is n by n and g is n by 1, right. So I am, I am, I am regressing g on g l x which is some, you know, exogenous variables and then also w x. So I am all not only, you know, spatially weighing the g values which is the dependent variable but also the explanatory variable. This is a very general structure that I have put in front of you. Okay, now this is going to be n by k, so I have a n by k sitting here, right, and then I have the model error u which is going to be n by 1. The um, parameters rho g and rho x are called as spatial uh, coefficients, coefficient parameters. These parameters explicitly account for the spatial spillovers and beta is my model parameter as I am already aware of, right. It is a coefficient sitting on each x value, right. U is just model error, everything that I did not account for in this model will go into this U, U is going to be a random number. The question that we are asking is why do we require W to be row standardized? Well, what happens is that, you know, I am trying to understand the impact of, you know, of the lags, the spatial lag on the value at location i. So I want to know how much do, you know, groundwater levels in the neighborhood impact groundwater level values at location i. In this, in this quest, you see in this formulation, this impact will be generated from two pieces of information. One is w and the second is g, right. What I am really interested in is this g and not in w. That is to say 
that my quest as an analyst is not about understanding whether more neighbors or higher connectivity causes groundwater levels to increase or decrease, but to understand what happens with the levels in the neighborhood on the levels at location I. Because I want to connect groundwater levels with groundwater levels in a, a neighborhood, I want to normalize the effect of the number of neighbors. I don't want to, the effect to be driven by the number of neighbors. In case I do not use, you know, I do not standardize WIs, then what happens is that just because some entities have four neighbors, this WI value sums us four times, right? And just because some other entity has just one neighbor, which is entity six in our previous example, they will just, they will have a smaller spillover, you know, just by the virtue of low connectivity. Well, that's not what I'm trying to learn here. I'm trying to learn the linkage between groundwater levels in a neighborhood on a location I, right? So in order to, to filter out the effects due to degree of connectivity, I am row standardizing my spatial weights matrix, okay? So I hope that is, uh, that is clear. Now, a property of this spatial lag is that it is similar to but not the same as window average in case of a time series data. So I have an example of a time series of sales per quarter. Now the time series is basically just, you know, uh, joining all the different realizations of sales in different, uh, you know, in, in, in quarters starting from 1986 to 1996 for some entity, right? The window average basically says, go to quarter three of your quarter four of 1992 till quarter one of 1994, right? Basically take six quarters and sum everything between them. So this scanner, this scanner will move step by step. This scanner will move one step here and it will look like the following at, you know, at T. So this will be for T plus one, okay? So now this scanner basically just averages everything between uh, you know, uh, 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 between uh, its these these windows and this window, this moving average window is moving as we go along the time periods. Now, spatial lag, if you think about it, is doing something similar. It's taking a weights type of a, uh, a spanner or a scanner side of a window average type of a like a window which goes through every value whenever I'm standing at a value i and uh, takes a you know, it just takes an average, which is a weighted sum, which is weighted average. The only difference is that here, the value at the middle itself, which is here in case of this time t and t plus one, these things do not, do not, are not counted in the weighted average, right? So the value at the location at which we are conducting this weighted, weighted average exercise or this window average exercise, that value itself is excluded in case of the spatial, uh, you know, uh, lag construction, right? So the fact that each location I is not her own neighbor means that the spatial lag is not a window average. It excludes the middle value. It, it excludes the value at the location where I'm standing, wherein I'm conducting a, you know, local average, okay? Okay, so a little bit more into, you know, a, just a little introduction before we will go into these things. I just want to introduce some of these variables that are constructed for a regression model. One first is called as a spatially lag dependent variable. Now, G being a function of rho WG, this here is called as a spatially lagged dependent variable, okay? And this, when it is added to a, you know, model that we are used to, which is, uh, you know, x beta plus u, if I were to remove, if I were to remove rho wg, I will get a model that I'm used to. When I include a spatial lag dependent variable, such a model is called as a spatial lag model. It's a specific definition is it's a spatial lag model. Instead of rho wg, instead of rho wg, if I were to include x beta plus rho x w x plus u, then such a model which includes spatially lagged explanatory variables. So now I have lagged the explanatory variables. So I'm saying 
the spatial effects are coming from the explanatory variable. So in case of house price data, the spatial effects is not coming directly from the prices of the homes in the neighborhood, but from the number of rooms in homes in the neighborhood or the public amenities for the homes in the neighborhood, right? So I'm sort of, uh, sort of, you know, uh, going over the example that we covered in the last class extensively, right? In that case, we call such a model as the SLX model or the spatial cross regressive model. And if instead we were to include, you know, these, uh, these effects in the error structure such that u is rho w u plus epsilon, then such a model is called as a spatial error model. Going forward, we will go over each of these models, uh, you know, uh, 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 one by one. We'll look at what they mean, what are the con is the consequence of including or not including these effects. How do we choose between these models, and so on and so forth. We will conduct that exercise. But for now, I just want because we have introduced spatial weights, I wanted to, you know, also introduce this uh, these three model variants of spatial in, of spatial regression models. Okay, so that's it for this part of the lecture. In the next part of lecture 18, we will be looking at what we started with is the departure from the classical assumption of causality that ensures causality that is assumption 2 of a linear regression model and we will see how do we, you know, uh, uh, obtain causal inference in spatial regression models, okay. So thank you very much and see you in the next part. Mm -hmm.